Now, I am here really uh, on behalf of a 91-year-old man living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And his name is Dr. Alfred Bader. At age 14, as a Jewish boy in Vienna, he had already been kicked out of school along with all the other Jews in 1938 when Hitler took over Austria. And um, a small British religious group called the Quakers was able to negotiate with Adolf Eichmann a train transport for Jewish children out of Vienna to England. So in December 1938, before the war, uh, the young Alfred Bader was on this kinder transport to England. In England, however, he, instead of being 14 when he arrived, when he reached the age of 16, he was arrested by His Majesty's government, by Winston Churchill, because all citizens or former citizens of the Third Reich, which was Austria at the time, including all kinds of Jews who were practicing or non-practicing, uh, were interned as potential Nazi spies. And he was sent to an internment camp in Canada where he and the others stayed for a year and a half or so until His Majesty's government realized that these could not in any sense or any way be considered as a potential threat to His Majesty's realm. However, when he was released from that camp, he found that the prestigious Canadian universities were not interested in admitting Jews from Europe into their student body, and he ended up studying at a provincial college called Queen's College, Queen's University. Uh, but faced with this adversity and this with this repeated social exclusion, he went on to do a doctorate at Harvard in chemistry. He set up his own firm in Milwaukee to produce research chemicals. And he invented, his son told me, what Amazon does today. You call up and ask for your chemical. He puts down the phone, goes into the laboratory, makes it, and sends it to you the next day. And in this way, he built what became the most profitable research chemical company in the world at the time. Um, but he never forgot his own experience with social exclusion and failure and, and being rejected. And uh, he was also very much taken with the uh, ethical demands of the Hebrew prophets. And he also has a, more than a side interest in classical art, but this is not a lecture about his life, only about Feuerstein, which we'll come to, I assure you. Uh, but in any event, uh, this man began to provide funds for different projects to deal with inequality and social injustice here in the Czech Republic, a great deal in the Balkans, especially after the wars there, and in Israel with the uh, Arab minority uh, there. Now, since he lives in Milwaukee, and since I grew up more or less near Chicago, you have to know that we Midwesterners are very down-to-earth people. And we're interested in beer, sausages, and potatoes. <laughs> Not fancy French cuisine, as you might suspect. Uh, and what that means is we want to see the results. We don't, the theory is all very nice, show us the results. And I came to you this morning at Dr. Vanyava's very kind invitation to talk to you about the results of Feuerstein intervention in a relatively small town in the middle of Israel between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem called Ramle, and the particular destiny of a comprehensive uh, junior high school there uh, in Ramle. 
Now, you know that I have my base in Paris, and I presume you all know the French expression, c'est la vie. And what that means to most people is there are disappointments, there are failures, there are unwelcome surprises in life, but c'est la vie. And I want to talk about a particular set of failures of the let us say, the general Western system of education, and ask you whether the response to c'est la vie is not Feuerstein. In other words, to make life somewhat different than it otherwise is. Now, we have to admit, all of us, and I think myself first of all, that in many respects, the educational system that we have is a tremendous success. The scholars, the writers, the teachers that the education system produces are uh, hold up the world. They're the pillars of our universe. But what about everybody else? What about the whole section of the population that never finishes high school, that doesn't get a graduate degree? And, and today, high school is just the beginning for the education one needs. And so I want to focus on that situation of failure how, and how we understand that and how we react to it. Now I have some statistics here from Israel about the percentages of students who finish high school and are qualified to go on for university. And two things stand out. One, as only the third man in the room, I have to say, boys do very poorly compared to girls. And in this age of women's rights, very few people are paying attention to, or asking the question, why do boys fare so poorly in our educational system? And in Israel, for all kinds of reasons, uh, Arabs, and there are boys in particular, fare very poorly, at least in the town of Ramle. I want to give you some statistics. Among uh, Arabs in Israel, the, um, in 1996, 24% of those who were studying actually qualified at the end of their studies for university. Now 38% do, which is a considerable improvement, but still it lags behind the overall average. And uh, the, the rate for boys now is like 31%, and the rate for girls is 45%. So we have this huge gap. Now I'm not here to talk about gender inequality, or whether Forstein is better at helping boys than girls, because I don't know. But I want to talk about the specific ORT comprehensive Arab school in Ramle. Now, five years ago, a woman by the name of Rabab Nasser took over as headmistress, as the principal of the school. And this school, she recognized, was a failing school. There was violence. The children came from the poorest neighborhood in Ramla, really one of the poorest neighborhoods in the country. So you can imagine, I think you have this in Lithuania as well, unemployment, drugs, alcohol, school dropouts, not really showing up at school if you didn't really feel like it that day, and so on and so forth. In French, in French, in Czech, a takdale, a takdale. <laughs> um, and she said, what am I going to do? I want to make a success of these schools. These, these children are being wasted. Their potential is being wasted. What am I going to do? Now, like any good student herself, she asked the experts. She went to the Ministry of Education. Look what I've got here. Look what I've got here. Help me. What do you suggest? She was a part of the ORT network. She went to ORT. 
we've had this school for years. The results are terrible. What are we going to do about it? So, and she went to the university professors and say, you're the experts. This shouldn't be the result. What, what action should I take? Now, if we had the time, I would ask you what you could imagine the advice was, and she followed every suggestion that she got. And I just spoke with her yesterday just to double check my uh, impressions. And everything that you can normally imagine, she tried. For example, try teaching in smaller groups. Break the kids up, right? A normal procedure. Try bringing the subject of instruction closer to your students. Show them with uh, material things they understand what it's all about. You know these mathematical systems where you start doing it in blocks and that sort of thing. I mean, these are ninth graders, but still bring it to where they live. In Hebrew, it's called hamchasha. In other words, that you can feel it. Bring the different teachers together and exchange best practices. What is this one trying? What is that one trying? Th these are great ideas, right? And the one that I like the most is add other kinds of activities after school. Sports, music, computers. The, the, the pupils will come to these attractive, even sexy alternatives. They'll see that they can do something. They'll gather motivation. And the motivation will come back into math and history and literature and Arab language. Now I want to teach you a <laughs> slang word in Hebrew. Zip. Zip. It means nothing. Zero effects for four years of trying every suggestion. And this is an active school principal with activities between Jews and Arabs and all kinds of enrichment. Zip. And she didn't know why. Why don't these systems work? Every, every, well, everyone is saying that they should work and they don't. Why? And she asked that question and uh, the experts didn't know how to give her an answer. Why? This, these were the tools they had. This is what they had learned works perhaps with more talented pupils from better off families where there's a culture of learning at home, perhaps with such bourgeois middle-class pupils, these systems work. But in her school, they did not. In her school, they did not. So one day, this is what she told me, one day she was just browsing on the internet and Ramle is, I don't know, a few dozen kilometers from Jerusalem where the Feuerstein Institute is located. She discovered Feuerstein. And uh, you know how it is. The system had given her prize money for trying everything. Not for succeeding, but for trying. You know, for, th this is how the system works. Um, you know, you have a general who loses the war, but he always gets a medal, right? So this was the sort of um, approach that was in place. And um, she looks at Feuerstein, she takes an interest, and she says, well, maybe I'll use this prize money to bring Feuerstein to the school. And that's what happened a little over a year ago. 200 entering ninth graders were given what I think in your jargon is called dynamic assessment. In other words, they were tested to find out not what they knew, but what their learning ability was. What was their potential? And out of that assessment came individual diagnoses of the capability of each of these 200 pupils and their weaknesses. You know, this one's impulsive. 
this one can't focus, uh, this one um, can deal with issues in space but can't deal with uh, the colors and, sh and shapes. I, I don't know, you know, different, different sorts of psychological insights into the learning personality of each of these 200 pupils. Then they were classified into homogeneous groups. About 20% were essentially illiterate. Illiterate in their native tongue, in Arabic, at age, I suppose, 14 or so. Another 20% were regarded as gifted, and then the others fell in the middle. And the second element was that all the teachers in the school, all the teachers in the school, were trained in the Feuerstein approach. The idea being then that Feuerstein would be taught in the school, in the classroom, to these 200 ninth graders in the course of the year, but that when they were studying math or history or science, those teachers would know how to structure their lesson plan according with the principles of uh, Feuerstein. Now, I have to confess to you now, I'm a beginner in all of this. So I don't know exactly what it means to structure a lesson plan about uh, why World War, II, uh, World War II broke out or World War I broke out. I don't know what it means to structure that according to the Feuerstein system. I'm determined to find out, but I don't know. These, these were the elements, plus, um, and here we can show some pictures, plus there was like a Feuerstein uh, counselor who would come to the school, I think once every two weeks, to make sure that everything was going. Now here, I think we have to turn off some lights to be able to see the picture. You see nice classrooms, nice desks, Everyone is, uh, has a nice haircut, stylish, and so on. But uh, we know where they're coming from. Okay? And here you have it, right? Look with what concentration he's going through the exercise. Okay? Um, is, that, is that the end of it? Yes? Okay. So, um, so for a year, this is what was practiced at the Ort Comprehensive School for Arab Children in the ninth grade, the whole ninth grade, in Ramle. And now, and I visited, and this was my exposure, first exposure to the school in June. And as I said, I wanted to see the results. I mean, the, the pupils said, this is wonderful, and I use it at home, my father starts to get angry with me, and I say, wait a minute, Dad, let's collect the data, right? And the people's lives, I mean, they told me how their lives have been changed, but I said, this, this is not good enough. I want to see statistical results, Americans like numbers, I want to see numbers. So, here you have, in the, not in the Feuerstein tests, in the standard educational tests from the Ministry of Education, where they were in math, the, the, all these uh, seven classes, where they were at the beginning and where they were at the end of the year. And you see for the weakest, the weakest children, uh, what a phenomenal difference this has made. So you have a 60% improvement on average overall in math and a 30% overall improvement in Hebrew. Um, let's go to the PowerPoint. The uh, Feuerstein uh, Institute also did a pre and post testing of all of the, uh, of all of the pupils according to the Feuerstein exams. And here you see, this is for the lowest level of pupils. The dark is uh, before and the light is after. 
And, uh, you know, I think these results are pretty impressive, frankly. Let's go to the middle, the next uh, group. No, not the, ra oh, well, okay, so this compares the Raven test, which, and you know what that means, and I don't know what that means. The next, organizer. Next. Okay, this is now complicated math. I don't expect, I don't think in this lecture we have to dig into this, but if anyone wants the whole PowerPoint on the results in Ramle, I'd be happy to send it to you. What the principal said is that this year after a year, the pupils come to school, there's no violence, they're calm, they have personal security in the classroom and, and greater motivation. And what happened, what happened was, that when I visited in June, you know, I said, this is, this is terrific. What are you doing next year? How are you continuing the project? And then I came in for a big disappointment. I actually became, even as a stranger, even as just a visitor, I became angry. She said, well, I spent all my prize money and we don't have any funding. So we need to continue this for one year, two years, three years more to have the whole school in the system. And we don't know what we're going to do. And I said to the Feuerstein people, how can you start a program when you don't have the funding to finish it. And we're in June, and the school is going to start in September. Well, my uh, emotional uh, outburst was uh, to no avail and really irrelevant. And like so many things in life, uh, if you want to get something done, sometimes you have to do it yourself. So, I beat up on the Feuerstein people to lower the price by 60%. And I went to Dr. Alfred Bader and got the money that was necessary for the second year. Now I want to put this whole story in a broader perspective, in the perspective of Dr. Bader's values. And then we have a short film and then I'll be open to questions. I told you that Dr. Bader gets incensed at issues that concern inequality and social injustice. But, when do you know that c'est la vie, you know, inequality is just the way life is, and when do you know that it's social injustice? And, what we're talking about, the, the statistics that I quoted to you about boys and girls, Arabs and uh, Jews in Israel, is called disparate impact. In other words, we just see that things are unequal. You as teachers know this. You, you present a, a lesson or a course over a year, and you're treating all the students with as much uh, equality and, and positive attitude as you possibly can, and some get it and some don't. That's called disparate impact. You're not, you're not, you're not discriminating. You're, you're, not, you're just putting it out there. And many school systems, it works that way. 30%, 40% qualify for university and the others don't. C'est la vie. That's disparate impact. What is fascinating what is fascinating is to say, once you recognize with Feuerstein that people who fail maybe are capable of doing better, and maybe if you introduced Feuerstein into the classroom they would do better, is the question of discrimination. Now, no one, or I hope no one, is saying only <coughs> students in rich communities can benefit from Feuerstein. 
only those who can afford it. That is, in my opinion, direct discrimination on the basis of class. There's, of course, racial discrimination as a possibility as well. We used to have schools in the United States where I come from for whites and for blacks. That's direct discrimination. But the really rele most relevant, in my opinion, and the most insidious is indirect discrimination. Which is to say, let's go back to the question of boys and girls in, in schools. You give a program, girls succeed about 40% better than boys, and you say, c'est la vie. No, we know now, ce n'est pas la vie. We know now that if we can introduce Feuerstein, all of them can perform better. And also we know, I think, that we have to start thinking, well, maybe boys need some other format, some other approaches. Not smaller classes, or maybe smaller classes, maybe sports after school, whatever it is, but we have to recognize that not every inequality remains uh, without an answer. And we have to ask ourselves seriously, when do, are we faced with an inequality that represents indirect discrimination? And that then calls for us to diagnose why the disparate impact, the inequality exists, and to think more seriously than the conventional wisdom allows as to what we have to do to change that. Let's watch the film, and then I'm open to questions. Thank you. <laughs>